Um, so my name is James Tan. Uh, I run a studio in Christchurch called Digital Confectioners. And I've got some of my team here, so it's very nice to see all of you. Uh, it's also nice to see the rest of you too. Um, now, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of leveraging Unreal Engine for uh, sort of live service-based games. And to give you a little bit of context, we released Dread Hunger. We soft launched it in around April. And a lot of lessons learned came from depth uh, from there. So some of the things that we really wanted to do was look at minimizing downtime. We've got a live service game. It's running all the time. There are servers. There are people playing the games. We don't want to have to take the whole game down just to run a patch. And sometimes that can be a trivial patch. And players just get really frustrated every single time. Um, so something that happened a while ago with depth, we were upgrading depth so that we could handle loot boxes a little bit better. And Steam added a few changes to how you handle loot boxes. And so we made changes to our back end and we made changes to the game's executable. And it turned out that some of the documentation on Steam's website was wrong. And so we had to go back and we had to change some source code. And what happened there was the whole game had to be taken down and as we brought it back online, you know, it's another half hour later. Uh, then we found there were some more issues, and so we had to take the game down again. And I think it was after about five hours, we were able to get the game finally back up, and all the issues had been fixed. But by that point, a lot of players were really frustrated with us. They weren't able to start their games. Their games were starting, and then we'd have to kill them all because we had to kill everything. So one of the things that we really wanted to do for Dread Hunger was to minimize the downtime as much as we possibly can. We also wanted to allow for very frequent balance changes. The big problem that we had with depth was that so often, given that depth was an Unreal Engine 3 game and we built so much of it using Unreal Script at the time, we had to actually take the whole game down just to change a few numbers in weapon uh, balancing. And what they ended up with, again, is you know there would be, be these massive patches for like a few number tweaks just because we either made a mistake or we wanted to roll some things back, or just uh, the community feedback from a new patch was so volatile that we just said, okay, we're gonna have to push things back a bit. And that, of course, led to, again, days of downtime sometimes, where the game was just down, up and down, up and down. We also wanted to reduce patch download sizes. Uh, again, this sort of fits in with the whole live service thing, where you don't want patches to be this you know, one gigabyte thing all the time. And for depth, it was often around about 200, megabytes minimum. And for a lot of us, we might think 200 megabytes, that's fine, it's nothing. But for those uh, that are living in certain countries, they have uh, sort of like bandwidth limits and they have things like caps. We don't have caps anymore in New Zealand, so we haven't felt that in a very long time. But I think they're starting to introduce caps again in, in places like the US. And if you've got players on mobile, they've obviously got data caps as well, and so they're not always playing on Wi-Fi. So that was one of the main things that we also wanted to ensure how do we actually do that as well. Finally, we wanted to, oh sorry, uh, we wanted to also improve how we monitor our servers. Um, so with depth, um, actually Lee's here in the crowd, he did a lot of work on that for depth, which was fantastic. And um, we had some good monitoring, but they're not as good as we wanted them to be. We, we, we really need to poll or get our servers to tell us, hey, are you, are you actually doing fine? Are there too many players on your server that you need, do we need to reallocate some to different AWS servers or something along those lines? And so we were investigating how do we do that better in Dreadhunger. And again, this is all to provide better experiences for our players. Uh, what, one thing we found with depth was sometimes what we would see is we would get these random messages on our Steam forums where people would say, hey, the lag is really bad on Europe. And we'd sit there trying to figure out why, but I think and we never figured it out, and I think it's because at the time when the events occurred, we were either sleeping or something on those lines, and because we didn't have any data recorded sometimes, we just didn't know what happened to them. So we sort of figured, okay, maybe one server went down, and AWS spun up, and we, we, we couldn't actually tell. And finally, we, we wanted to, and together with this whole thing, we wanted to improve trivial mistakes and, and how we could fix those really, really quickly, really, really easily. Um, sometimes we find that we added a new feature to depth and it was all broken and it didn't actually work or we had some unforeseen consequences. Maybe players found a new meta within the depth gameplay and so they thought, oh, I'm going to abuse this you know, until they next patch it. And so either we panicked and decided to just 
again, shut the whole game down, rip it out, and then bring it all back up again. And of course, this is really frustrating for players because every time we, not only did we take the game down, we also had to get them to download another two, 300 megabytes, all just so that we could turn on a Boolean to say, okay, turn this thing off. Um, and that was really bad. So we wanted to do a lot better in all of those regards for Dread Hunger. So one other thing is, the way I like to structure my talks usually is I like to talk for a little bit and then give people an opportunity to ask me questions rather than saving it all the way until the end because sometimes you might have a, a really you know, interesting question that you'd like to ask about what's on the slides at the moment uh, and then I can answer it right then and there before it's like the, the thought is gone. Okay, so one of the things that we investigated was we're looking at independent client server patches and we, we have a couple of terminologies for this. Um, so for server patches, we call that out of band. And uh, it's, it's really useful to, to structure your code in such a way that allows you to do this. So one of the things that um, we couldn't do in depth was to independently patch the server and the client. And the reason why we couldn't do that was because the client and server were often running exactly the same code and exactly the same script code. And to prevent sort of anti, uh, to prevent cheating from happening, we would, the way we would structure our anti-cheat was basically just do checksums against both both sides. So the executables had to match, and the script bytecode also had to match. But that, of course, did not allow us to do independent server and client patches. In UE4, it's actually quite nice. Uh, you don't have to do these types of checks anymore. Uh, you can do other forms of anti-cheat. Um, as a plug for uh, the Epic Online Services, they now have anti-cheat available. So you can now use that rather than trying to roll your own system. And if you architect your code in such a way where you've got areas where you say this side is for the client, and then they hand over, hand the data over to this side, which is all server side, um, you can actually do very nice sort of uh, update the server and you roll out the server updates to all of your servers. And as long as the client and the way you've structured it, uh, the client could just stay the same version as it is. It doesn't need to change anything. And so if you can separate out and move a lot of your game logic over to the server where ping is allowed, uh, I would encourage you to do that as much as you possibly can. Um, and it's also great from a, just a nice clean code architecture point of view as well, where you can, uh, another great way uh, to stop cheating from happening is you essentially uh, just sort of use defines to say this is all server code so the client executable doesn't actually have to have any of this code as well. So when you've got clients trying to hack your, uh, sorry, when you've got players or hackers trying to crack open your client to see what's in there, um, they'll just find ma just functions that are just empty. So that's the sort of a really nice additional security bonus that you can get out by just sort of laying out the code structure in a way. Um, for those of you making blueprint only uh, multiplayer games, you can actually do it in such a way where the blueprint functions um, are separated out so that only those run on the server and then you've got separate client functions and then you can have shared functions between the two. And what that allows you to do is basically say, okay, so these blueprint functions only execute on the server, uh, so that way if you need to change something or balance change or do anything to that function, you can do that, roll out your patch to all of your servers that only do um, blueprint code and then from that point of view, it's, it's like you can actually roll out patches without affecting anybody else. So you can keep your clients up and running, you can keep your games going, um, but if all the logic is sort of handled on the server side, that's fantastic. Um, you can also architect things so that um, the server can provide overrides. So rather, so if the client is still doing something, they can still keep doing it, uh, but if the server can step in at some point in time and say actually this is the correct value you should be using, you can do those kinds of things as well. It's really, really great. So you can also look at, um, by, by making these changes in Dread Hunger, we're also able to look at patch cycle prioritization. Um, so we can do as many server patches as we want because we can, we can shut down half of our servers, get them up onto the new spec, and then players that are still playing on the other half of the servers, eventually when they roll off and they roll onto the new servers, you then patch that side. So to players, they just don't see any downtime at all, which is fantastic. Um, Client patching is always really painful and you want to avoid that as much as, as you possibly can. 
So, fantastic. All right. Uh, before I move on, does anybody have any questions in regards to maybe their game, in regards to how they could integrate this in their games, or anything like that? Okay, crickets. Cool. All right, hot fixes. So, um, how is a hotfix different to doing a patch? Um, hotfixes are really nice because sometimes for really trivial changes, uh, we can make changes to the client without them ever seeing it at the same time. So they will actually never see a patch, uh, but it will just be invisible to them. So the way that we often do this and the way that this works is often we section out some assets or some configuration files and we say these files, these assets are hotfixable. And so the way that they're downloaded on the client could be done at runtime. And so if we roll out a hotfix, we are basically saying, here's a bunch of new files that you should always check to make sure that they're up to date. So in your cycle of how you launch a, a game, in Dreadhunger, we actually have a very sequential title screen where it says, it does a bunch of things like logging in, but in that step, we actually add in a step to say, check with some master server to see if I've got the latest files. Um, and these aren't massive assets, they're often just configuration files or very small data table assets, that kind of thing. And because they're really tiny, players just don't notice because it's like one kilobyte or two kilobytes at the most. And the nice thing about this is that this allows you to think about, well, everything can be hot fixable at this point. And in that example with depth, when I talked about how we released a new weapon and it basically changed the whole matter of the game where people were wildly abusing it, uh, with a hotfix, you can actually just then say, you know, turn this thing off so it's no longer available. You could add a bit of extra messaging to players to tell them, hey, we're turning this thing off because of some unforeseen problems or something like this. Um, but it's actually really nice because then it allows you to have much more control rather than this whole meta just running away and basically destroying your community. Um, I should actually point out that the main reason why we're doing a lot of these things is because as live service games or as always online multiplayer games, if you let something happen for too long, particularly when toxic behavior is involved, it can actually just kill your entire game. And when, when the game is dead, it's, it's, often hard to, it's often really hard to revive it. So, so that's why we, we want to do all these things. All right. So we have a bunch of configuration files to basically hotfix the server. And one of the big things that we do with this is basically when we structure our gameplay code and when we, when we structure our code, we actually have a whole ton of flags for a lot of different things. So then that way it allows us to say, okay, um, this part is broken, but it's not necessary for the game to function, so we'll just turn this off. Sometimes when we add new and really risky features uh, that we feel like, okay, if we release it, uh, we would have to do um, a server rollout in order to roll this back, that would be an instance where we would say, this is really where we would want to have something to control this. Uh, and, and the other things that we use this for as well is if we have um, a lot of back-end infrastructure. So often they'll just contain hard-coded URLs or something like that. You might just put that in the game code or you might put that in the executable. And when you want to change it, that's it, a really painful patch. So these are really good to just put inside a configuration file. And you can also configure these configuration files in Unreal so that they never actually wind up on the client and you only keep them on the server. So the other great thing you can do is, uh, oh, on that note for servers, you can actually do the same thing for clients as well. Um, so if clients are seeing numbers or they're seeing um, things like uh, what assets they can see or things like that, um, hot fixing is a great way to just turn it off for a client if you want to as well. You can also use, in Unreal Engine today, you can also use configuration files to hotfix localization. Um, nothing's worse than releasing a patch for your game with localization and it turns out to be the wrong thing. Or um, So a story that we had here is in depth. We, we localized our game to Japanese for the first time. None of us in the office really spoke Japanese that well, um, nor, nor or less read, uh, can read Japanese. And we had the word bloom in our, in our settings. And we all know what Bloom is. And the problem was that translators had no idea what Bloom is. And so the way they translated it was, you know, like a flower that's blooming. So it was totally wrong. And so <laughs> our Japanese players were kind of laughing at that. 
Um, they had a good laugh at that. Um, but at that time, because it was depth, we had no way of really patching that without, again, taking the whole game down, updating some localization files, and then bringing the whole game back up again. Um, and so that's a, a really terrible way of doing things. So with Unreal Engine 4 now, it's great. You can actually, local, you can actually uh, send a hotfix file out to change a bunch of localization. Maybe the messaging was wrong. Maybe you wanted to, maybe in our case, the, the, the entire word was wrong. You can also use configuration files to hotfix asset types as well. And that's what makes it really interesting because you want to start rethinking about how you architect your games entirely in the first place. So a lot of us, when we're, especially me, when I'm prototyping very quickly in Blueprints, I'll just make all the variables inside the Blueprint itself. Or if it's in C++, I'll just make all the properties inside C++. So if I'm making a weapon, I might specify what class it is. I might specify what subclass of ammo to use, or I might specify how much ammo to consume, and all these different types of properties. And we just shove them inside the Blueprints and C++. You might want to start thinking about using things like data tables for this because if it's pointing to an external source, you get two benefits from this. One is that for a designer, they can work in something primarily like Google Sheets, or if they really want to, they can use Excel or something along those lines. Great thing about using Excel or Google Sheets is that they can uh, not only store those values there, you also have historical evidence. You don't have to roll back through purpose to figure out what was changed and why it was changed, and more importantly, who it was changed by. Um, you can leave comments in things like Google Sheets or Excel. So there are a lot of fantastic reasons to do this. But the other fantastic reason to do it is that now that all of these uh, properties are stored in data tables, you can later on post-modify them in configuration files. So if you're pointing to class A and, and that was a mistake, you can then upload a hotfix file to your master server to say it should actually be class B. Um, and this solves that problem of just making really trivial balance updates where um, sometimes in Dread Hunger, sometimes uh, normally it would take four slashes of your sword to kill a wolf. And for some reason or another, it turns out to be that's wrong. We actually, you know, as we're watching players play the game, we figured out that's actually too strong. So we want to just hot fix it so it takes five slashes rather than taking four. And you can do this for a variety of uh, data types now. You can do this for curve tables. You can do it for float curves as well. Um, you want to check out a plugin called the Hotfix Manager. Uh, and it does a lot of the stuff for you where you can do a lot of these different things. And so it's fantastic. So um, if you're building a multiplayer live service game, these are definitely some practices that I would strongly encourage that you start thinking about doing. Um, Okay, uh, infrastructure integration. Okay, so um, in Dreadhunger, we use a lot of different types of backends and infrastructure to do a lot of different things. Uh, we have one thing to look at how do we handle lobbies. We have other services to look at storing experience for players. We have uh, infrastructure for yeah, doing a wide variety of different things. And I think one of the really important things here is that what libraries do you often want to use for doing these different things? And um, for those that don't know, many, many years ago, I used to be a, an evangelist for Epic Games. Um, and so as a plug with, uh, for Unreal, <laughs> um, it comes with a ton of libraries to help you just do these things now. Uh, you don't have to use uh, or find a C++ library or find something that exists somewhere on the web or something you even have to buy. It's just already in the engine. Um, so with the engine now, it comes with an HTTP and an HTTPS module. Um, this is uh, async, it's fully compliant, uh, and it's really useful for remote server management. And so in Dreadhunger, uh, one of the things that we have is we can inspect what the server is doing, we can inspect what players are on that server, uh, we can then follow through and see whether or not we want to do bans on that server so we can kick somebody out immediately. Um, we can do a whole bunch of things. And again, this is all to help circumvent with toxicity. Um, in Dreadhunger, it's ex uh, because it is a sort of a, uh, it's a social deception style game, it's really easy to be super toxic in that game. And so something that we really wanted to control was if somebody is super toxic and we see them on stream, 
we, we actually want to do something about it, um, and that's to probably kick them or ban them, or we want to mute their VoIP or something along those lines. Um, has any of you ever dealt with super toxic players in their multiplayer games? Okay, cool. Have you guys had professional trolls? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, just a little story with Dread Hunger. We had this super professional uh, toxic troll and basically all he would do is just jump onto every single server that we had and immediately start yelling slurs at everybody. Um, and at the very beginning, you know, when we thought about Dread Hunger, we were like, oh, it's a social deception game. You know, most people just play these with their friends. Uh, but on release, what we found out is that most people don't seem to have lots of friends. Um, <laughs> Uh, so they, they were just playing with just rando people, and of course this person being super toxic, um, it immediately turns up and immediately he's yelling into the microphone just all of these slurs, and, uh, and so we quickly had to find a solution. And uh, it, you know, as I was saying, it's, it's super great when you just have a module there that you can immediately use, and then you can roll out, well, in this case we had to have some downtime because we had to roll out a new patch. Um, but it's super useful just having that, that accessibility there where we can just do it. Um, for those of you that like WebSockets more than HTTPS or REST APIs, um, again, there's a web, WebSocket module there. Um, and we use this more for real-time information about what's happening with our servers. So rather than having to constantly poll our servers what's happening, um, the Dreadhunger server can actually just connect to another service. Um, and whether that's something like Grafana or something along those lines, it can just keep pumping out values and we can just sort of check every now and then on our phone, you know, what's happening on our servers. Are there lots of people playing? Are they going down? Are they dying? Are they running out of memory? Or are they, you know, just what, what's happening here? Um, so super useful information. Um, for those of you that want to go a little bit more bare metal, you can go down to the TCP and UDP level. Um, and so for the reasons, for what we use here is actually um, to use really old protocols like um, A2, A2S, where you just want to query a server and just send some quick packets and be like, how many people is on your server? What map are you playing? How far through are they through the game? And all these different types of things. Um, so all of these modules are super easy to use. They're all asynchronous, so none of them are ever synchronous. We, you know, you send a packet to an HTTPS server and you go, hey, what's happening with you? Um, and then you sort of stall the game waiting for a response. Um, and there's actually lots and lots of examples in Unreal Engine as well. So you can have a look through all of those to see how they set them up and how they use them and, and all that sort of nice thing. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff isn't really available for Blueprints right now because a lot of it does rely on asynchronous code. Um, but you can make some changes to the engine that gives you that kind of level of support as well. Cool. Um, so I have loads of stories about toxicity and stuff like that. I don't know how much of that I want to go into, but does anybody want to hear those, or does anybody <laughs> you want to you want you guys want to hear more of that stuff? Okay. Um, so we have lots of uh, people that say they're not toxic, um, but they actually really are, and they're actually always trying to circumvent um, what it is that we're doing. And the nice thing with real-time server monitoring is that you can actually match some of that data, because you know their Steam IDs, um, so you can actually start looking for patterns of behavior between all your different servers, between all your different things. Uh, and so with, with much more sort of remote management of what's happening on your servers, you can send all of that data to some other endpoint, and you just have a bunch of bots that just scour through all of this data, figuring out, you know, is this person actually being toxic? Um, and we started getting some reviews where people were like, bad game, it tells me that I can grief people, but I actually can't because they're banning me. Um, or, or, or they'll say something else where they're just like, I'm actually a really good player and they banned me for no reason, so you should not buy this game. And that often comes up with Steam reviews, unfortunately. Um, but when we can do this big, this you, with this post of like all these stats of like, is this you? <laughs> you know. Um, so I don't know if that's us being toxic, but... Uh, <laughs> But it does help a little bit when people go like, okay, you know, maybe these, maybe the developers aren't scumbags, and maybe they're right, and, uh, and and they've actually got some proof, and they're actually working with statistical analysis uh, rather than just blind guessing because you know somebody reported that person or something like that. That's the, the funniest thing we find about toxicity is that unless you have all of this evidence, which they'll deny anyway. Uh, unless you have all of this evidence, it's very quick for the community to turn around on you really quick. 
because they'll just make up a story where they're just saying things like, oh yeah, they banned me for no reason. And, uh, and, and quickly the community turns around being like, oh, maybe I shouldn't buy this game because you know, they're just banning anybody for no reason. Um, but when you have tools like this, it's, 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 it's fantastic. So. All right, so let me just check the time we were at. All right, so deterministic cooking. Uh, so how many of you tried using the deterministic cooking features in uh, Unreal Engine 4? No one's, no one's had a look at that, okay. Um, how many people are worried, if, how many people have, uh, let me rephrase this, how many people have been told about deterministic cooking in Unreal Engine 4? Okay, <laughs> okay. So deterministic cooking is, uh, is a process in which you can, uh, when you package your game ready for shipping, you wanna make sure that the content that never changes actually doesn't change when you cook. And there are lots of reasons why this can happen, and when this does happen, it, it just blows out the size of your patches tremendously because uh, it might change some little tiny property, and when you repackage it, it thinks, oh, this, this asset, which actually hasn't changed, has changed, so therefore it's new, so it should be included in the patch, and then when you upload that patch to Steam, Steam goes, this, all these binary files have all changed somehow, uh, and that results in you know, two gigabyte patches when all you've done is change some very small functions or something along those lines. And often it sort of tends to happen when you've got assets that aren't deterministically initializing correctly. So if you're using blueprints, for example, and you're using construction scripts, if you put a random uh, function in there, it's going to generate randomness every single time, right? And from a gameplay perspective, you're like, well, that's what I want it to actually do. I want it to randomize its appearance, or I want it to randomize its behavior, or, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing about that is that construction scripts get run as soon as the object is instanced, and that can happen while things are cooking. And so if you're doing that a lot, that will affect your patch sizes tremendously. Sometimes uh, out-of-date assets could be saved on an older version of the engine, which had deterministic cooking problems. Um, so the old uh, Cascade system had some of these kinds of issues where the Cascade modules, well, I guess this is irrelevant information now because that's been removed, but uh, I, I'll just explain it anyway. Um, some of these uh, Cascade modules were actually non-deterministic, and so sometimes what you'd find if you had a really complex particle effect is that that was being recooked every single time. And, uh, and it was coming out different every single time, which then led to bigger and bigger and bigger patches all the time. Um, so depth kind of ran into this problem and we never really truly solved it with depth. And so what would happen is that we changed, we changed uh, something like, a, like a, a, an archetype, which had like an integer value and we changed just that integer value and the patch is 300 megabytes. Um, why is it 300 megabytes? We don't know. Um, and so, but what I could, what, what I could say is probably happening is that the cooks were not deterministic at that point in time. So with Dread Hunger, sometimes our patches are as small as like 10 megabytes, uh, which, is, which is way better. So how can you actually figure out whether deterministic cooking is actually happening or not? Uh, there is a tool in Unreal Engine 4 to generate patches for you. Has anyone had a chance at looking at those systems before? Cool, awesome. Um, so for those of you that haven't had a chance to look at this, uh, it's actually a platform agnostic way of patching your game. So rather than say build a whole new version of your game and then just put it onto Steam and then Steam decides however it wants to chunk up its, before I talk about that, has anybody looked at the way, or has anybody had a chance to look at the way Steam actually generates the patches for, okay. So the way Steam does it is uh, it, can, it does a delta between the old version and the new version and tries to figure out what's different. And the problem is, is that it does this in little blocks. And it basically tries to figure out, you know, block A, B, C, and so on, um, which blocks are different. And if that block is different, upload that entire block. And if you've got sporadic sort of binary differences between your, your patches, what you're gonna get is sometimes really big um, patch sizes because Steam's decided that you know, a thousand out of 10,000 blocks have changed, even if that's not true. Um, and that could be something when you've added new assets, it just pushes all of that data down the line kind of thing, and so then all of these blocks change. And so with the patch, 
generator that you can use in Unreal Engine 4, it actually generates you a new pack file, which you can then just put alongside the main pack file, and then Unreal Engine actually then says, okay, cool, there's some new changes inside this new pack file, so I should look at that first. Um, but the useful thing about that is you can also unpack that to see what's actually inside it. Um, so the, a good way to actually test whether or not deterministic cooking is actually happening or not is you can actually look inside this patch pack file and actually see what's actually happening in there. So if you've got, for example, a skeletal mesh and you're not sure whether it's being cooked deterministically, you would run the patch generation, a new patch pack would come out and you could actually just have a look inside that and see what's happening. Uh, finally, um, packaging logs will also warn you if assets are not being cooked deterministically as well. So uh, if, you, if you're running Jenkins or if you're running something else to, to package your game continuously, uh, you can make Jenkins actually throw up a, a build warning to say, hey, you know, these assets were not deterministically cooked. Send an engineer to have a look at that. Um, and all of these efforts, again, is really to help with our patch sizes. We don't want them to be big because we want to minimize downtime. All right, this is the last slide that I have. Um, thank you very much. And um, so versioning. Um, I want to get a show of hands of how we do versioning. Um, so the way we used to do versioning in depth was we would just use the SVN number. Um, how many people do that? Or no, we've got one, cool. Um, in Dread Hunger, we use something else completely differently. Um, I'm, I'm actually really curious, what do other people use for their versioning? Because maybe I'm gonna learn something here. Do you guys just increment point 0.1 and go up? Use semantics? Oh yeah, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, Cool, all right. Uh, so what we decided to do in Dread Hunger was that we actually decided to break it up into three different parts. So we used a, a major number, a minor number, and a, and a server number. Um, and the reason why we do this is because um, how many people have to how many people have problems dealing with um, pirates for their games? Like it's it's become a, like a, a big enough problem that they want to deal with them. Kind of okay. Um, well, uh, as soon as we released Dread Hunger in Steam, it was pirated pretty much immediately. And one of the things that we found that could really stop them was just changing this version number. Uh, and, and when we incremented the version number, we just made our servers just check that number. And eventually what we found was that after you do it like 10 times, uh, most of these pirates were really lazy. So they just download the entire game, for example, and just put it onto whatever and then just use like a, a hacked Steam client DLL file to bypass the Steam checks. Um, but because these uh, pirates would have to play on our servers, we just made a check for this number. And after doing it like 10 times, eventually all of the pirates got so sick of constantly having to re-download this game because, again, the pirates were really lazy. So they would just, you know, send you, they'd be like, here's a new update for the game at 10 gigs, because that's what the size of Dread Hunger was zipped up. Um, and eventually all the pirates just got sick of it because they were like, I've downloaded this nine times and it's wrong. Like, why is this, uh, you know what, I'll just go Steam and just buy it. So, <laughs> so, so eventually that's what happened, so it was really cool. So, um, so it seems like there's two lessons. Make your game really big um, so that pirates have a tough time downloading it, um, and then that way, uh, yeah. So just bumping up the version number just, just made that, kind of eventually made that problem go away. We eventually, um, new pirates would, would uh, we read the comments on these pirate websites, and we'd see the comments, and they would say things like, Hey, the game doesn't work anymore, and, and, the, and the person who runs the pirate website will be like, oh, they've just updated the game, um, I'll, I'll make a new version tonight. And then we immediately do another update again, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and so, and then and they're like, you just uploaded a version, it doesn't work, like, why doesn't this work? And they're like, oh, they've updated it again. Um, and because our patch sizes were really small at this point, you know, like five, 10 megabytes, um, it, it meant that our players didn't notice any problems, and these were also server update only kind of things, so, um, and, and we could hot fix the, the version number. But of course, the pirates can't connect to our master servers to get the hot fix, because we'd hide that, we, you know, we'd actually validate, you know, what's your Steam ID, do you actually own Steam? And if you actually own Steam, this is the, hot, this is the actual version number you should be using kind of thing. Um, 
And, uh, and, and as I said, the pirates were kind of lazy, so they just uploaded 10 gigs and just said, here's a new version. And eventually they got so tired of it, they, they just stopped supporting death. Uh, sorry, so they just stopped supporting dread, hung supporting dread Hunger, where they're like, okay, no more updates, I mean, we don't care about this game anymore, so fantastic. Um, all right, so uh, why do we use major, minor, and server? Well, we use server, so the server part is actually for us. It's, it's only for us, it's never actually client-facing, so they actually never see it. And the great thing about this is that we actually just know what, what version the servers are running on, so that way when we're rolling out an out-of-band fix, that's when we can tell, okay, this server's running this version, and it's got some players in it, so we need to schedule that for an update next time, da da da, da so on. So that's, that's the reason why we have it. Um, the minor is really just for the, the kind of pirating problem that we talked about, because we're kind of like, this is a minor update, and, and we'll make up some stuff where we'll be like, oh, we optimized something, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it, it allowed us to do those kinds of things. Um, and then the major is really talking more about version compatibility here. So if somebody's running 0.7, they can't play with 0.8, and that's just a hard, nope, you can't do that. Um, so we had thought about doing things where clients on slightly older versions could still play with clients on slightly newer versions. And the reason why we thought about that as a possibility uh, is mostly because one, we didn't, some, what we find with depth in the past was that everybody constantly always had to be on exactly the same version or they couldn't play with each other. And so sometimes what would happen is that they would boot up depth and say like, oh, I've got to run a patch and it's going to take an hour, cancel, close, go to a new game. And so we, we thought about the possibility of maybe we don't enforce clients to always have to patch to the, the very latest version if the, if the minor revision is so minor that it doesn't matter. Like, for example, maybe we just fixed a UI offset. Um, something on the, on, the, on the HUD was slightly out of, you know, misaligned or something like that. And it was like, okay, that's still worthy of a patch, but maybe players will just never notice it and so they don't care. But then again, we also don't care as well. So we're just kind of like, okay, maybe these minor revisions are, are fine if they play with each other. Um, so using this kind of system, we've also found that we can handle a lot of other patching kind of concepts as well. And this worked really well for things like PR and, and marketing beats as well. So often when we did minor updates like you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, these were good signals to our community of saying, look, there's just some new content being added, but it's not a major thing. Uh, and then when we worked together with our PR company called 1PR, who are fantastic by the way, uh, what we found was that when we wanted to do a major version, it, it, it for some reason had a really big, meaningful impact to players when they're like, oh, they're, they're going from like one to two. Um, and so it worked really well with sort of PR and marketing at the same time. Um, so that was, it's, it was something that was kind of a happy accident for us more than anything else. So the other thing as well is that you can use uh, versioning to stop content leaks as well. So uh, how, how, many, how many people here deal with concepts where they need to keep like their next patch kind of secret for a while and then when they release the next patch, they don't, but they also don't, but they, so let's say you're preparing for something where you say like, we want to do a big release and we want to show off our new skins or new content two patches from now, but we have to start making it today. Um, but because of QA reasons, we can't, we don't want to make sure it doesn't leak into the client. Does people deal with that sometimes? Yeah, cool, awesome. Um, so what we do there is that we use versioning, like we actually version the assets themselves. And so then that way when the cooker runs across them, it just says, oh, um, I'm cooking for this particular version and these assets are marked for that version. So ignore those, move on, and cook the rest of the assets kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's a really great way of actually just removing that kind of headache of like, did we remember to remove this from our build servers? Did we, you know, or, or just other things where the new, new skins got leaked and people are like, oh, there's less. It, 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 it just works against you for your PR beats and your marketing beats when things leak too early and people just, they just lose all excitement for it because they're like, oh yeah, we've already seen it, nothing's new or something like that, so. Uh, the other great thing that you can do in Unreal Engine as well, in Unreal Editor, so you, you, can, you can actually customize what the, uh, these property widgets look like, or what these variable widgets look like. And so if you've got a really, if you've got a sufficiently complex um, struct that represents your major, minor, and server, or if you're doing something else, uh, you could actually write a custom widget inside Unreal Editor so that it makes uh, versioning much easier for everybody else on your team. 
Um, you can leave notes. Uh, you can say things like, here's what we actually expect in this patch. So then that way people aren't assigning the wrong thing to uh, the wrong version. Cool, that was my last slide. Um, so I've left a couple minutes for Q&A, if anybody's got Q&A. Um, you can ask me anything about Dread Hunger if you want, or depth, or, yes. Um, if you could wait for the mic, I'll bring it to you. Oh, yes. Thank you. It I just totally ensures that. that all questions get recorded. How do you actually make a separate build for a server and a client? Um, so Unreal Engine 4, uh, the way we, we build it is that there are actually command line parameters that say this is specifically for the, the you know, it, I think it's like target equals client or target equals server. Um, and that spits out the two different versions for you. Um, you do need to set up different um, build.cs files that specify this is the dedicated version, uh, server version, and this is the listen to, uh, sorry, this is the client only version. Um, so for Dread Hunger, we only use dedicated servers and clients only. We don't distribute things. No, we do actually distribute a listen server, but it's not. Um, so in Dread Hunger, when you play the game, um, initially you go into other people's lobbies, and that portion of the game is peer to peer. So somebody sets up a lobby, and you're all on sort of like a uh, 18th century kind of ship. Um, and then when they actually sail off into the sun, um, that is when we connect them to another server that then puts them into a new place. So that's how we do that. So, um, so a lot of these lessons uh, that we learned do sort of have to be in that realm where you are controlling the servers. If you're not controlling the servers, it gets a little bit harder. Um, and that's also why we could do things like um, like stopping pirates. When they join our servers, we just go like, what's your version ID? And if we made that number up and just don't, don't, didn't increment it like one, two, three, four, and just made it like one, you know, 70, 23, you know, it would, it would help circumvent that a lot. So that's how we could control it. Um, so in the hotfixes slide, you talked a bit about uh, having config files of all the game variables and being able to edit them and then release new patches. Um, how do you decide how many of the game variables you want to be in there? Because if you expose everything, it's going to get really messy. So mm -hmm. how do you decide what, which functionality in the game is most important to update? So, so, how, so how do we decide that is really up to the designer. So if the designer is really confident that the value that they're going to add is the right value and they never ever want to change it, um, and that's sort of at that point we can say, okay, well, maybe it doesn't need to be in there. Um, but if, if it's sort of like a shrug, I don't know, maybe I do want to change it, maybe I don't want to change it. Um, it's, it's, that's kind of the level of decision making. So we, we often just say, leave it up to the designer, they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, which is, I guess, I'll pass it off to somebody else. Yeah, somebody else's problem, they'll, they'll, they'll sort it out. Um, <laughs> we just make sure to build the system so that they're aware of it, um, and so then that way they can take advantage of it when they need to. But it's also great from like a, a, a quick balancing point of view as well, of just like, we don't know what's gonna happen when we release this new weapon, or we don't know what's gonna happen when we release this new feature. Um, it could be really, really unbalanced, we don't really know. Often when we're doing playtesting for Dread Hunger, we will play it in a very specific way that's very different to how, um, how our community plays it. So um, a, as an example, um, we have a mechanic in Dread Hunger where you have to carry nitroglycerin, and as you run with it, uh, it, it sort of uh, starts to break apart and eventually it'll explode. And what we found players doing was that they would throw it in the air, then jump forward and catch it, and they'd do this, they would do that infinitely. Um, and so we started having to think about, well, maybe we need to start adding stamina so that we reduce their jump. You know, just things like that. And, and it's super nice to be like, well, we don't know if this mechanic is gonna work or not, and we also don't know if the feedback from our players is gonna be really negative or not, because maybe that's a fun mechanic, and purely as game designers, we're, we're just like, well, we don't like it. Uh, but maybe they do like it. Um, and so if there's extreme backlash, uh, there wasn't in the end. So, but if there, is, if there is a situation like that where you're sort of going like, oh, I don't really know what's gonna happen. We're just gonna have to test it and we're just gonna see what's gonna happen. Um, then it's fantastic to put it into a hotfix because then you can say like, oh, um, everybody hates this thing. Okay, turn it off. And then that way, no harm, no foul kind of thing. And community goes back to, being happy or complaining about something else. <laughs> Online games, that's, that's the way they go. Hey, 
Um, how do you decide how frequent to do uh, patches and how large the patches should be? Yeah. Um, so frequency of the patches really depends on just what we're seeing the community doing. I think the main thing about a live service game that we're finding is that it really is a situation of, okay, so most of us think about building games, we just tend to think we'll make a thing, we'll make it perfect as much as we can, we release it, it's out there in the wild, it's now done, we move on and do something else. Live service games are really different. Live service games are more like you've built a hotel and the hotel's really nice to begin with, but eventually, you know, uh, I guess in this case, uh, people who stay in hotels or customers will say things like, oh, it'd be really nice if you had this. It'd be really nice if you had that. So you, you sort of get that constant feedback loop with players and what they're expecting and what they're wanting. Um, and, and often when they find something that, um, a mater that really breaks the whole game, um, they'll complain about it and they'll want you to fix it as soon as you possibly can. And so when those situation occurs, it's really nice having these kinds of systems to just be like, okay, we'll fix it today. And, if it, and sometimes it doesn't even require a patch and we're just like, oh, we fixed it. Um, and so in those particular instances, customers are really, really happy because they felt like they're being heard. They felt like that they, they sort of get that instant gratification of I made a complaint and they actually fixed it. And I didn't have to download anything, so that's really good. Um, so sometimes we might release a, a, a sort of like a, a new sort of uh, major version of Dread Hunger, and there will be just this flurry of hot fixes after that, um, or flurry of patches after that, where we minimize, and, and because we're minimizing, and because we have that focus right at the beginning to minimize downtime, and, and, and try to minimize even client patches through hot fixing, uh, we can, we, we feel confident that we can do that thing, rather than repeating that experience with depth, where it's like, oh, you know, we, we have to make a new patch because this is really bad. Oh, but that's a 300 megabyte patch that we had to do, and we had to take game down for like three hours to make that happen, and et cetera. So um, most of those concerns kind of just go away, and it's really, up to, uh, it's really up to designers, it's really up to community managers to decide that, okay, yeah, let's do, let's do a hotfix. Um, well, hotfixes are easy because clients never see anything. And client patches, again, is, it's, it's less of a headache to know that it's only going to be 30 megabytes or it's only going to be 10 megabytes or something like that. We have time for one more question if anyone else has one. Hi. Um, uh, how was how it using Unreal Engine 3 compared to 4? How easy is Unreal Engine 3 compared to 4? Uh, way easier. Um, Unreal Engine 4 is, uh, first of all, um, because, because it's being used so widely and for one of the biggest live service games out there, um, it, uh, a lot of what Epic is doing is also helping us as live service games creators as well. Um, and I think that's one of the, I've always said this when I was an Epic Evangelist, is that that's the major, major benefit of Unreal Engine, is that they themselves are using their own, they're dog fooding, right? They're, they are using their own technology to make games at the same time. And when they feel that there are obvious pain points, uh, they rush in and they try to do something about it. Um, and because they themselves are working on one of the biggest live service games, that immediately helps out a whole ton because if they're having that pain, you're gonna feel that kind of pain as well, probably. Um, and so Unreal Engine 4, way, way, way easier than Unreal Engine 3, I think. Um, Unreal Engine 3 had a lot of interesting problems, like we said, with that the bytecode of scripts had to exactly match between servers and clients. And so every time we wanted to do a, a balance change, we wanted to do even just a minor scripting change, we couldn't do uh, server-only changes. Um, and yeah, patches were just constantly 300 megs, 300 megs, 300 megs, so way better, way better. Excellent, okay. Um, well, I think uh, we're all out of time, so well, thank you very much for coming to my uh, talk, and uh, hopefully you learned something. Thank you very much.